this uh, morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, kind of recap a little bit of last uh, Sunday, because last Sunday was, la- was Bad News Sunday. Last Sunday was all about bad news. And I gave you that disclaimer early on. I say, you know, this is bad news. And, and so, but in order for us to see how glorious the good news is, we must understand the depth of the bad news. And so this morning, I'm going to touch base just a little bit with you on the severity, the depth, the, you know, how dark is really dark. And my hope is that by, by, by the end of today's message, that you will have a greater appreciation, a greater understanding of the beauty that we have in Christ, that you will have a better grasp of what good news really is and what it means to you today and what it means for your life tomorrow. So I'm going to rehash around this idea of gospel now, gospel, like I said last Sunday, is, is literally meaning good news. And in order for good news to be good news, it has to invade bad spaces. That's how good news is good news. Good news is good news when it invades these bad spaces, bad spaces like anxiety, worry, fear, depression. It's, it's when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, uh, you don't have what you thought you had. And all of a sudden, that news is really good because it was set in the backdrop of what could potentially have been really, really bad news. You know, it's, it's, it's when, when, uh, when something happens, right, you're, you're expecting the worst. You're expecting the worst in a relationship or the worst of a situation. And all of a sudden, you get something better than you, what you expected. And all of a sudden, good news becomes really, 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 really good news. It becomes great news. And the same thing with with life is that the greater understanding we have of the bad news that we have in humanity and as as a created world, the greater appreciation we'll have of the good news. Because we all understand this basic principle, and that is the world is busted. It's just broken, right? And all of us know that to a certain degree. And and if you're in certain professions, you're really tuned in into it. If you're, like I said, uh, if you're a police officer, you know that the world is really busted, if you work in the medical field, you see it frequently. If you're an oncologist, you see it very, very frequently. You see how busted the world really is. And if you work in social work, you see it firsthand. The brokenness, not only of the world around, the, the children that, that they see uh, like a enormous house, but also the, the depth of the depravity that a person can have can be pretty, pretty, pretty dark. And occasionally, for those of us who don't have that profession, occasionally the the fog will lift, right? And and we'll be tuned into, we'll dial into this darkness because the fog lifted. And sometimes the fog lifts because we get sick or somebody we love gets sick or somebody passed away. Perhaps it feels like it was too premature. And so for a moment, we get this collective gasp almost this this collective sense that it is not all well and it is not all well with our souls and it's in those moments that that we're left to wrestle with this gnawing in our hearts we're left to wrestle with like what do we do with this yearning for wanting more and yet not really knowing what that wanting really is we're left with this desire for satisfaction and yet not really knowing how to satisfy that desire. And so we, we want this completeness. We want to be complete. Thank you, Jerry Maguire. You know, but yet never really finding what that completeness really is all about. And for some of you, you've been chasing after that carrot for years, years and years and years and years. You've been chasing it, chasing that carrot years and years and years. And you're at a point maybe in life where you're like, I st- I'm still not there. You know why you're not there? It's because you were never intended to get there by yourself. And just like we saw last week, there are certain cisterns or certain uh, wells that we build, you know, metaphorical wells, uh, where we try and draw water out of, but they have m- immense cracks in them. And so we can't really draw what we want to draw out of it. In Jeremiah, we saw last week in Jeremiah 17 that, the God says, you've, you've rejected me. You rejected my, the source of life and water and satisfaction, and you've traded it in for the stuff that you're creating. And uh, we tend to go to four different wells. And if you can imagine this being a, a well underneath uh, with some water, cracked as it could be, and broken as, and shattered, we tend to draw into four major cisterns or wells. And the, the first one we try and draw, draw into is the, the well of ourselves. 
You know, we think that we can fix ourselves. If I could just fix me, right? The idea goes like this. It, maybe Jesse 2.0 will be better. <laughs> maybe you had a picture of what you thought you would be during this season in your life, and you look back, and, and you're thinking, man, I never arrived. And you try and fix yourself. You try and f- fix your quirkiness. And you try and fix the, the, this, this thing in you that seems to be broken because it is. And you try and fix it. We try and fix it by, by getting a better version of you. You know, it, it's, 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 uh, I thought it was funny to just kind of see what the number one selling book is. It's Six Minute Abs. <laughs> six Minute Abs. I, that's, like, that's like really our culture has turned into the Six Minute Ab kind of culture. The quick fix you know, it used to be a day where it was uh, uh, thunder thighs or whatever it was, right? You know, it, what, what did that do? We try to fix ourselves with physically, emotionally. And at the end of that rainbow, there is no pot of gold. It's just even more dissatisfaction. You know, we try and fix our, our, the way we look. We try and fix what we have and get a better car, a better home, a better you fill in the blank and and at the end of the day, it just doesn't get fixed, does it? You know it, I know it, we know it. We know it to be true because we just have been in that road and we still find ourselves with dissatisfaction, with this, this gnawing inside of us to be satisfied and yet never really being satisfied. For some of us, we go to others and we think that maybe if I just you know, put all my eggs in one basket and, and draw on the well of others. Maybe they will satisfy me. Maybe, maybe if I just go to other people, other relationships, man, I'm going to find the satisfaction I'm missing. And so many people pursue that. And they pursue that intensely. And, and you get married. For some of you, married, you get married. And then, you know, that doesn't, you feel like still dissatisfied. And you feel annoying of incompleteness. So you start kind of, testing the waters other places, trying to drink out of other wells that are broken, soon to realize that those wells don't really satisfy either. But we try it. We try it so hard. And for some people, it's like having more kids. You start having more kids and more kids. And it's not because, man, God has called you to, to be fruitful and multiply, but it's because, you know, you're having more kids because you feel like, you know what, maybe another kid will, will fill that void in my life. And, and then you quickly realize that it didn't. And it's not because of your kid, it's just it's because the void is still there. Or maybe you go from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship, always looking for that void to be completed by that other person and yet never really finding it because you can't find it there. And we place all these expectations on people that we encounter, expecting them to do something they can impossibly, they can't impossibly fulfill. And they can't fulfill it because they're not God. They don't make good gods, you don't make good gods, we don't make good gods. I know for some of you, you're like, what? Yeah, like we're not, like we're, we're not gods. And we don't make good ones either. For some people, they draw into the well, the broken well or cistern of the world. And, and that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because the world, you know, we run to it because it, it's, it's there and the, and the world has these gifts from God. And when we exchange God for those gifts, we quickly realize that, realize that the gifts aren't enough. And, and in some instances, what we do is we take the good gifts of God and we distort those good gifts of God. We take good gifts and we just abuse those good gifts, whether that be sex or alcohol or those are good gifts, but in their proper place, right? It's, it, it's, it's intended to be there, but sometimes we abuse those things and we go outside of its its proper place, and, and, and it's just unsatisfying. It's like the child who gets a present uh, during Christmas, and he grabs it, and he kind of shakes it, and uh, open, tears up the wrapping paper, opens the, the gift, and sees the gift, and it says, throws it to the ground and breaks it, and then blames the parent and says, why did you give me that? And that's oftentimes what we do with God's gifts. We just kind of break it. We break that good gift, and, and, we, and we go back to God and say, why did you do that, God? And it just doesn't satisfy that blue bell at the end of the day. You know, it just satisfies for that moment, right? A couple of scoops in there, and that kind of satisfies for a little bit. You feel like, oh, thank you, God, for blue bell. Thank you, God, for ice cream. And then you're in the second bucket. <laughs> you know, you realize that you're lactose intolerant and, and that you never should have taken it to begin with. Boy, the moment, it feels so, so good. 
And there's still something that's not long-lasting, right? For the moment, you feel good and maybe even takes you to appreciate God as the giver of that gift. But at the end of the day, you're still left with this emptiness, this brokenness, this sense of there's got to be more than this. And it's because there's something that is broken, inherently broken inside of us. And for some people, it's the pursuit of, the, the pursuit of religion or the running towards the empty well of religion. Where it's an outside-in job, not an inside-out, right? Religion tends to be an outside-in job. And I'm not trying to diminish the value of religion, but I want to put it in its proper perspective. Because religion at its core says, let me change my behavior so I can earn the favor of God. Let me tell you something. No amount of religion will earn you the favor of God. It won't because there's something that's broken in there. And, and religion is like trying to change ourselves with, but with a choir robe on. It's with a Christian banner on. And if you notice, over time, religion causes this sense of bitterness because you were hoping that it would bring you satisfaction and it didn't, so you become bitter at it in the first place. Because you can't find it. You can't find wholeness there. You just can't. It wasn't designed for that. Our brokenness was a result of sin entering the world and fracturing the cosmos in the process. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, it fractured everything. It fractured the galaxies. It fractured the stars. It fractured everything in creation. And it fractured us too. And now there's this eager yearning and longing for what it used to be. Yearning for paradise lost. There's something inside of us that kind of wants that, that, sh- that shalom that we talked about. That peace, that harmony that we find in the presence of God. And we long for that harmony and we don't find it in anywhere else. Because everything else is broken. And just at the time that we want to kind of blame shift and and give it to Adam, right? Like, Adam got us into this place. Whoa, it's Adam's fault, right? We begin to realize that although it it is through his line that sin reigns and rules, we still add to it, don't we? We still add our own rebelliousness to it. And that's why Romans chapter 6, verse 23, or 323, is so familiar to us, which says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Just when we think, man, maybe I can just blame it on Adam. Just he, It's his fault, right? You know, he's the one that partook. Woe is me. Just as, as we begin to go into that mentality, we, we realize, wait a minute. Like all have sinned. Like all of us. No exception. No exception except for Christ. And we are not victims of Adam's rebellion, but a participant in his rebellion. In other words, like we actually add to it. We actually participated with him. And, we, and at times we participate, participate with him daily. We choose, we chose willingly to rebel as well. And, and you might be here this morning and be thinking, man, we're getting back to last week, you know, bad news. And yes, it is bad news. And I want you to realize just the magnitude of that bad news because in a little bit you're going to get the good news. And boy, it's going to seem so much more glorious. But we're going to get to the bottom of this because it has to invade dark spaces. And what are those dark spaces? I want you to go to Mark chapter 7, verse 14. Mark chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Then then Jesus called to the crowd to come and uh, to hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. It's like, listen, listen, guys. It's not what you eat. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. It's not what goes into your body that makes your soul dirty. It's not what you eat that makes you feel yicky inside. You know, it's not what you, it's not that. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your, where? Heart. He flips it around. He says, no, no, no. What defiles you, it's not what's out there. It's what's in here. And in verse 17, it says, When Jesus went into the house to get away from the crowd, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. Do you feel that sometimes like that? Like when you read scripture, you're like, what did he mean? The disciples did too. And hopefully you don't feel that way when you leave. You're like, man, what was he talking about, right? <laughs> but the disciples are confused. They're like, you know, what, 
what is he, ta- what is he talking about? Verse 18, he says, don't you understand either? He asked, Can- can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. Great way to put it. <laughs> basic biology, right? You consume it, it comes out. That's it. You know, it's basic biology. And the next uh, part of the verse, for those of you, well, I'm going to ask, ask it this way. Who likes bacon in here? Like, oh my goodness, we are in Texas. This is awesome. All right, for those of you who like bacon, you might want to put a little thingy in your corner of your Bible because this is going to be your verse for, for the rest of your life, for those of you bacon eaters. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Can I get an amen for the bacon eaters? Amen. <laughs> it's like a resounding amen. Amen. <laughs> Preach it. Let's go further on the bacon deal. Verse 20. And then he added, it is what comes from inside, inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. And see, just like that, Jesus turns it, turns it around. He says, you guys think, you guys think that you get defiled by what you eat because they had dietary laws and they had cleanliness laws. And so they were restricted on what they could eat. And they were not only restricted, but prohibited. And then there was these laws that they had to clean a certain way before they could eat. And, and so they thought that what they touched make them dirty. What they ate make them dirty inside. That's what they thought. And so we can do one or two things when we feel dirty inside, when we feel our soul, you know, you get that feeling, you're like, man, it's just, I just feel like, like, ah, there's just sin in my life. Listen, that can be a gift from God. I, I just said that it could be a gift from God. Your sense of weightiness when you're like, man, I just feel like, ah, like there's something inside of me that's broken. I feel like the, the sin is just overwhelming me. That could be a gift from God. If it draws you to the right place, it could be a, a gift from God. And we tend to do two things with that inner guilt or inner shame or inner sense of sin in our lives, dirtiness. We go to religion, that's one of them, which is I'm going to fix me so that God doesn't destroy me. Right? It's like the idea that, man, I'm just going to fix myself. I'm, I'm going to be a good boy now, a good girl now, because I don't want to be destroyed by the creator of the universe, by, by my own creator. And so you, it's a pursuit of religion with that in mind, to try and avoid somehow God destroying you. And what Jesus is saying here is like, you've pursued religion. You've pursued getting all these things just right, not eating these things and not and cleaning yourself in these ways because you've tried to avoid something, but it, it hasn't led you anywhere. And so in the same way, you might be thinking, man, we don't do that. We don't think that the outside does anything to our inside. You know, you, you might be here thinking, you know, I, I don't think that. I don't think that what I do somehow dirties my soul. I want to put it this way for you then. And listen, before I say this, just know I'm not checking your Facebook, your Twitter account, your Instagram, your Snapchats. I have too much busyness at home to do that. So I just want to put it out there. So the activity that you participated in that made you feel so ashamed, whatever activity is, you know, whatever you did, maybe it was a lie, you felt like it was a little lie, but then you feel so guilty, you know, maybe it was at work, you, did, you didn't do or did this, you know, maybe it's something, maybe in your relationship with your spouse, something happened and you feel, afterwards you feel so ashamed, maybe you got busted, right, you, you got busted doing something, you're like, ah, I feel so ashamed, you know, that, that, that activity that, that, that resulted in, in the inward shame is not what made you dirty inside. That activity, whatever that activity was that you participated in, is not what made you dirty inside. 
You're like, but I felt like it. And I did this and I felt this way. So it must have had like the outside influence me. Let me tell you this. It's going to be one of the most profound insights you'll get today. Your soul was dirty already. So you did that activity. Let me say it again. Just to understand kind of what I'm saying. Your soul was dirty already, which then led to that activity. In other words, the real problem wasn't the activity in itself. It was inside ourselves. You don't do sinful acts to make you a sinner. You are a sinner, so you do sinful acts. We're all sinners. It is because we are a sinner that we do sinful acts. So what is the implication of that? This is the implication. When we go to uh, religion or uh, in our case, church, we, we, we're like, okay, I'm just going to modify my behaviors. I'm just going to be better at it. I'm just going to kind of absorb the language that's here at church. I'm just going to, uh, you know, what they do, I do. And so I'm just going to mold and kind of fit into this mold, into this family mold. And, and then I should be okay. And we think that, 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 that we're going to be okay if we just do the things that other people are doing here in this family. But the reality is, is that our heart will over, overflow out into our actions and attitudes. And what's worse, what we try and do is this. We try and have other people kind of conform to our behavior. I get it all the time, folks. I get it all the time. People will say, hey, you should talk with so-and-so. They're doing such and such. And I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, does such and such even know the Lord? I mean, because it doesn't matter. You can change everything about you. Everything about you. Everything of how you relate to life, how you relate to other people. You know, you can change the, the way you talk. But at the end of the day, that's not your problem. And that's not their problem. The problem is in the heart. The heart of the problem is the heart. That's the problem. So you can, you can clean the outward without even cleaning the inward. Without even cleaning the inside. And so... For other people, it's not religion. When they feel dirty, they feel like, ah, what do I do? You sh- you sh- there's blame, and many of us wouldn't confess to that. We, we just decide, you know what? It's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. And on top of that, it's not just somebody else's fault. It's maybe my circumstances. Because I bet you there's some of you that are out there, and you're thinking, you know, Jesse, no, 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 no. Like, if you just knew Billy Bob Joe Sam and my family... When he shows up into my house, you know, at a party, oh boy, you know, we all get angry. And if you knew him, you'd be angry too. As a matter of fact, if he would walk into the church, you'd be already wanting to punch him already. So some of you are thinking that, like, if you just knew my neighbor, if you just knew Billy Bob Joe Sam, then you wouldn't be saying that. Because when I'm in the presence of Billy Bob Joe Sam, man, I sure feel like super angry. I feel like a violent part of me is coming out, and I feel just like letting that violence just come out, Right? Or am I the only one that kind of does that? <laughs> Come on, you're all sinners too. So, you know, what is it? So, so some of you are like, no, 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 Jesse, if you just knew what God gave me for my children, oh my gosh, you know, or what God gave me as parents or, 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 or my spouse, we wouldn't confess that here. You know, especially if she's been right next to you, you wouldn't confess that. But if you say, you know, like, you know, if you just knew, listen, listen, I just want to say, they didn't make you do anything. They just threw out what was already inside of you. Billy Bob Joe Sam didn't do anything to you. Didn't force you to do anything. Didn't force you. You chose. This is where I'm he- heading at. You chose to let out what was already in there. Billy Bob Joe Sam just exposed what was inside of you. That's why I tell people, you got, you, you got to push through beyond two years of marriage because the first six months especially, oh my gosh, you get married, and for, all, most of you know this, you get married and all of a sudden, like you're acting in ways you never acted before, you're losing your temper, you're having adult temper tantrums, you're in the floor like a little child, you know. Oh, wait a minute, that was just me. Uh, but anyway, you're like, you know, you're really like, and you're like, man, she just gets the worst out of me out. And it's like, no, 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 she doesn't, you know. You know, it, well, it was already in there. 
It was already in there. She, it, she or he didn't bring it out. That was already in there. And it's like, uh, I've shared this story before. It's like when my son and I, the first six months, you know, we're listening to TV, right? And she's uh, in the bed. It's a small little apartment. You know, I'm in the bed, in the edge of the bed. She's you know, laying down. And, and so I don't remember how it goes now, but, you know, she kind of raised the volume. And I'm like, you know, you got to lower it. So I go up and I lower that volume. And, and of course, she's got the remote, you know. There's the first problem. And so she starts, you know, putting the volume up, right? And so I'm like, it ain't going to work that way. So I'm going to put the volume back down. And so we're in this, we're waging war with each other for control, right? She's got the volume. I got the TV. That's okay. So we're doing this thing. And all of a sudden, it just blows up. And by blows up, I mean I blow up. Ah, man, get your control. And I go to the living room. She's chasing after me. Which, by the way, ladies, don't ever chase after your man. She's chasing after me because I want to just cool off. She doesn't let me cool off. She's like, it's, I'm like an island and she's like with her, with her rowboat, right? You know, going around me. I'm like, okay. So I lay down. She's right there talking to me. I get a pillow and I cover my face because I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to see anything. And she's still talking. I grab, it was a small pillow. So it wasn't big. So I throw it at her. You know, and so she's trying to dodge it, it hits her, you know, and she goes off, off me even more. I'm like, gosh, and so I'm covering my face, and all of a sudden, the, the proverbial, the bird comes out, right? I'm just sticking out, and all of a sudden, she's laughing, I'm laughing. Not that that's a solution for your lives and your marriage. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying, you know, give the bird to your wife, your husband. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that what she did at that moment, she brought out what was already inside of me. It was always already inside of me. It was, it was nothing that wasn't there already. <laughs> it's a sense of control and the sense of, I want it my way. And so she just revealed what was in me, just in the same way that I revealed in her what was already in her. <laughs> she says, no. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> and so just when we think, you know, like, wait a minute. No, she caused it. He caused it. Jesus just breaks it just powerfully in verse 21 for from within out of the person's heart come evil thoughts sexual immorality theft murder adultery greed wickedness deceit lustful desires envy slander pride and foolishness and jesus is saying you know just as you think that it's that it's out there it's not it's not you decide whether you're going to hold that thought captive whether you're going to arrest that thought you decide whether or not you're going to forgive or not you might be here you might be thinking you don't know my story jesse you don't know my story. You don't know how I grew up. You don't know, you know what, the, the kind of things that I endured as a little child. You don't know what they did to me when I was growing up. And of course, I don't forgive because, because of what happened yesterday or because of what happened when I was a child. You think, of course, I don't forgive. Of course, I'm angry. Of course, I have bitterness in my soul. Of course, I do that. It's because of him or her or the world that circumstance. And what I'm saying is, no, 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 no. It isn't. It isn't. You're not a victim of your circumstance. And I know it's, a, it's hard to hear, especially if you grew up with a very, very troublesome background. But what I'm saying is that you're not a victim of that. You choose. You get to choose whether you're going to forgive or not. You get to choose whether or not you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to let it go. And I'm going to move on. You could either arrest that thought, that bitterness, that anger, or you can let it arrest you for the rest of your life. Because the heart of the problem is the heart, not the circumstance and not the person. The real issue isn't our marriage, our, our addiction, our struggle, our loneliness, our depression, our lust, but it's our heart. That's the real issue, folks. That is the real issue. Well, if my spouse would only know there is no well. Well, what if? No, no, it's, it's not a what if. We choose to dwell on what we dwell on. So where's the good news? Here it comes. Go to Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Because in order for good news to be good news, it has to what? Invade bad spaces. In order for good news to be good news, it has to what? Invade bad spaces. So I've given you the bad space. It's the wickedness that resides in our hearts. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says, when we were utterly, what? Helpless. Some of your translations says weak. When we were utterly weak and helpless. I want to stop here for just a second because 
God loves the weak. He oftentimes saves and uses the weak to shame the strong. Because God loves the weak. And in our culture today, in our culture, we don't see this, this wanting of weakness. We actually resist it. We want to be strong. The idea that we would be perceived as weak, we, it's, it's almost like an aberration for us. We just don't want any part of weakness. We run from it. And, and I'm telling you, you need to see yourself as weak. Brother, sister, you need to see yourself as weak because you are weak. Because that's where God meets you. And some people may say, you know, Christianity is just a crutch. Yeah, it is. Your legs are busted. (laughs) Your legs are busted. You're spiritually busted. You need a crutch, and the crutch is Jesus Christ as a person. And some people say, you know, know, Christianity is is for the weak-minded. Yeah, Our our, our mind is weak. We need a crutch. And our crutch is not religion. Our our crutch is Jesus, is the person of Jesus. This week, uh, I got to see the power of of God through weakness. Uh, I was meeting with someone who lightning has struck her when she was a little child. And she had a lot of surgeries, a lot, a lot of surgeries throughout life. And when people thought she wouldn't be able to talk, she talks now. She, people thought that she, she wouldn't be able to amount to much. And she has, she has a job. She has a child. She, she's like, she, I look at her and I'm thinking, wow. People see weakness. I see God's strength. Because she's functioning and she's, I mean, she's doing stuff that she should never have been able to do. But The power of God is being demonstrated in her. Weakness is not bad. We need to see that we were were actually weak. Then he continues, says, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Just the right time. You see, when you and I were at at our weakest, at that appointed time, God rescued you. He rescued me. At that point in time. And some of you might, thinking, might be thinking, you know what? I wish I had a greater story. You know, some people, have, they, were, they were addicted to whatever and then, and then they found Jesus. Or they were addicted to crack or they were drunking, drinking every time. And, and there were all these things. X, Y, and Z. And it's just all this story. And oftentimes that leaves some of you like, man, I wish I had a story. Like, no. God met them when they were weak. God met you when you were weak. At the appointed time, according to this verse. At the appointed time, just the right time is when he met you. And he met you when you were at your weakest. When you were at your weakest. Your story is your story. Don't begrudge it. Don't think, ah, man, I wish I had a better story. No, no, no. Your story is your story. Your story is a story of somebody who was in either either active or passive rebellion against the, the king of the universe. When God met you. And then he goes on in verse 7. It says, Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some or someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. I mean, perhaps he would die for a person that was good, maybe for our kids, right? But would you ever die for your kid's bully? And yet God did that very act of sending Christ to die for us. While you and I were enemies of God, in active rebellion against God, Christ died for us. He gave his life for us. And God hasn't saved you so that you can stay there. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. God rescued you from there. He rescued you from there. And then we continue in verse, verse, verse number nine. It says, And since we have been made right in God's side by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Man, 
by the death of Jesus Christ, we have been made justified or, or made right. He has made us right by the death of Jesus Christ. We have, think about it, folks, like we were in rebellion, and yet somehow he just put us in right standing before God the Father. That's what Jesus did. He died and put us in right standing. You might be thinking, I'm not always in right standing. You know what? That's all right. I understand. But nevertheless, he put you on a right standing before God. Not because of you, but because of Jesus. Because of Jesus in you. You starting to cast the good news? A glimpse of the good news? Notice in verse uh, 10. For since our friendship, our friendship with God was what? Restored. Say it with me. Was what? Restored. By the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. You were restored. Now, if you remember last week, I talked about how Adam and Eve, they were in the perfect harmony with God. Called, that's called shalom. They were in perfect harmony with him. There was no relational ambiguity. There was vulnerability. There was acceptance for who they were. There was this tree that was put in front of them that they couldn't partake of the fruit of. Mainly, in my belief, is so they can experience the joy that we get in obedience. We have been restored to that. We have been restored. Our heart has been restored. You see, we are given new hearts by God of the universe, and we are given desires or affections in that new heart. You and I have a new heart. If you've placed your faith in Christ, you have a new heart. The heart of the problem the good news is that God, the great physician, addresses your heart. In the past, you, know, you, you might have wanted to fix yourself. It's like, no, no, no. I'm going to give you a new heart. You're going to long for things you've never longed before, and that is to be in intimacy, relational intimacy with God the Father. You're going to long for things you never thought you longed for, which is to do right, not because you have to, but because you want to. You're going to want to obey me, and in your obedience, you're going to find deep satisfaction in that. And that's good news. And, and that concept we're going to explore more and how, how that good news of the gospel kind of invades our life and how it looks like, what it looks like in our lives. But you are no longer a slave to what you were a slave to before, your desires before. You're no longer a slave. You might go there, but you're not a slave to that. You are free, and you are free to worship him just like Adam and Eve did. Where you find real satisfaction in obedience. See, that's good news. And we were rescued and saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and to God's glory alone. And we don't do good things because we have to. We do good things because we want to. It goes back to desire. See, Real religion is when it, it overflows out of a deep desire to please the Lord. It comes out of the affections that he has given unto you to pursue him. That, you know, that's the essence. You do things. You, do, you start doing you know, the things that you see others doing, not because you want to be like them, but because God is moving you in that direction. Now notice in verse 11. In light of this good news, in light of the good news that he died for your sin, he took it all on the cross and he has given you a new disposition, a new affinity towards the things that are from God, a new heart towards him. In light of all that, verse 11, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Restored, right? Back to that Beautiful rhythm that Adam and Eve had before the fall, before they partook. Back to that. Now, what does that mean in, real, in, in practice? What does that do with the, with the inner longing for, for satisfaction, right? You cultivate the longing for God. You cultivate that, th those affections and those longings that have been placed in you. You begin to cultivate those. 
And that's what the remainder of the series will be about. How do you do that? How do you do that? But another thing you got to realize is it's a couple of things. This is how we respond to that gnawing feeling inside of us, a brokenness. You got to realize you can't fix yourself. Only God can. God can fix your rebellious child, mother, husband, wife. God is the one that does it. Not you, not me. It's God. You can't fix yourself. I know that some of you are like, man, but I feel so. Listen, it's God has implanted a new heart in you. And yes, you still struggle, but heart, the heart that is rebellious, God is the one that begins to fix it. And, and second of all, the, the, the broken wellspring or broken well of fixing by others, like others fixing you or you fixing others, it doesn't work. You don't need the approval of others. You already have the approval of God. You don't need to be chasing after, well, I just need to have God into the approval of Susie or the approval of him or her or, the, or my peers. No, no, you've, have already been, you've already been accepted. You've already been approved by God. You don't have to run to the world anymore for comfort. Sure, that bluebell feels really good. Man, it feels really good, but it doesn't satisfy as much as God satisfies. And yes, those are a gift for our enjoyment and for the glory of God. Yes, those things are true. But God is the source of your comfort. He is the source of your satisfaction. Now, you don't have to prove anything to God. You don't do religion because you want to prove anything to God. God has already had Jesus pay the debt that you and I owed on that cross. And it's interesting to me that as gruesome as the cross was, as horrifying as the cross must have been, as painful as it must have been not only to endure it, but actually watch your best friend, John and Peter, watching, you know, looking and seeing Jesus on a cross, as painful as it was for them, that cross is actually good news. And it's good news for you and me. That Jesus would take the punishment that you and I couldn't take. And that is why we rejoice. And that is why we just come before God fully approved and bask in his presence with utter joy and contentment. He's enough for you. Let's pray.